and welcome to Build. I'm your host, Brittany Jones Cooper, and today we're talking about Tina, the Tina Turner musical. The show follows the icon's rise from rural Tennessee to becoming the global queen of rock and roll. Daniel J. Watts plays Ike Turner, the singer's infamous ex-husband and musical partner, who is known for his tumultuous relationship with the icon. Please help me welcome Daniel J. Watts. What up? <laughs> Daniel, you know, I saw this show, and it is action-packed, high energy from beginning to end. I just want to know for you, what has it been like? Because it's just been open for a few weeks. Like, what has this ride been like so far? Oh, man, I'm just now starting to feel like a regular person. <laughs> Again, you know, grocery shopping, <laughs> laundry. Uh, it's been uh, incredible. Just, you know, Adrian is a, one of my best friends, you know, for years. So, like, to watch her go from Tina in London to Tina here. Like, the show hits differently here. Mm -hmm. um, Tina coming, Tina Turner herself coming, opening night. Me feeling all those feels of like, are we cool? We good? Um, you know, it's just been an incredible ride just to like unfold Ike Turner a little bit, dig into that, and um, tell this this tremendous story about a woman who overcame a lot of obstacles, but learned along the way that she's actually always been this mm -hmm. fiery, passionate person. She didn't become this thing; like she was always this person. I think that's what is so impactful about this musical is you see this woman, this icon, and we see all of her accomplishments. And obviously from the movie, we know of the, the turmoil she's had to overcome. But I feel like the musical really goes into her backstory. And you just see all of the kind of personal obstacles she had to overcome. And it just ties you so much more to her story and her journey. Sure. You, you feel that way when you first saw the script and you're just like, wow, this woman has overcome so much. Yeah, I was thankful for the script that it actually, you know, the film, we're so, we're really like, it's like a huge cultural thing, you know, and the film didn't really talk to Tina much, you know, like Tina signed off on it, then the film was made and they kind of like did their own thing. They Hollywooded it a little bit. So like uh, Katori, who's also from Katori Hall, who's the writer, is from Tennessee, you know, so she brings this Tennessee black woman, I get you thing to, to, the, um, to the story. And she did her research. She studied Ike's, she read Ike's autobiography. She did Tina's autobiography and kind of like wove both of them together yeah. to tell a more cohesive story. Yeah. Let's talk about Ike. Let's. This man is complicated. Yeah. I want to know what kind of research you did to sort of get into who he is and the why of maybe why he made some of the choices he made. Yeah, Ike Turner. <laughs> Ike is a black man from the Confederate South you know, who had a, an entire life before he met Anna Mae Bullock. And by the time he met her, he had learned, the world had taught him, or at least America had taught him that he was worthless. Yeah. Um, and that, you know, people are gonna take advantage of you. He was molested as a kid. You know, his father was killed by a white mob for talking to a white woman. His music was stolen. You know, his one of his wives had been taken from him and put in an insane asylum. Like, all of this happened before he met Tina, so by the time he met her, he was pistol whipping Ike. Right. Um, so it doesn't excuse any of his behavior, but it just kind of gives you a little more context of a, a broken individual. And you know, Tina was also a, uh, grew up in an abusive household. Her father left, her mother left. So you have these two people who probably don't know how to love each other or how to love themselves, trying to work something out. They don't even know what love is. They don't know what love yeah. is. So you know, for Tina's, you know, perspective, at least Ike is there. Ike is interested. Ike, you know, Ike is showing enthusiasm about the thing that she does that she wants to do for a living. That's enough to stay. You know, that's a reason to like get involved with somebody. And Ike, I would say that a lot of his his shortcomings are not justified but understood. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's why I asked the why because yeah. you know, obviously we see the domestic abuse. That's horrible, but there's obviously trauma or something that happened to him. Yeah. And I think the way you bring him to stage, you can see that insecurity and that vulnerability in him, which doesn't excuse his behavior, but yeah. you can see his brokenness. And, yeah. and I think you really bring that to the stage. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. So what other kind of work did you do? Did you um, read his autobiography? <sighs> did you get to talk to anybody who knew him about what he was really like? No, nah, I read his autobiography. And in reading his autobiography, I found that we both have very similar traumas. Mm -hmm. um, I grew up in the South. Um, I have, uh, you know, I have child abuse, not from my mother, <laughs> um, you know, but I have my own personal stuff. I've been to therapy also. So like I could connect through that. Like, oh, hurt people hurt people. You're hurt. Yeah. Got you it. You know how to okay. process that. I, I know how to process that. I know what that is. I know how you can easily switch it off or how you can easily ignore it, um, the hurt and the pain. 
So I read his autobiography. I went to Clarksdale, Mississippi, which is where he's from, mm -hmm. um, just to like get a sense of the air, you know, to know what 304 Washington looks like, Washington Avenue looks like. He used to cut through this alley on his way to school. I know what that alley looks like, you know. So like his memory started to become my memories in a way, which is a little tricky because it becomes symbiotic. So then I couldn't like take him off at certain times. Um, so that was the hard part, learning how to take him off every day. Um, but, you know, hearing what people sound like, listening to the music he listens to. Um, he loved Louis Jordan. I was one of his biggest fans. Um, he he was a big fan of Louis Jordan. So I was listening to a lot of the music he was listening to just to see what he was ingesting, yeah. just to get a sense of him. I love hearing that process because you're playing a man who has been really controversial in her life, sure. you know, and he can be labeled a villain. But I think in order to play a villain, you have to kind of get to understand who they are and what makes yeah. them up. And I just love hearing you did that work because, like I said, I can see that vulnerability in him in, on stage where you don't want to just only villainize him because you can also see the pain that he's, like, he's just acting out because he doesn't know how to, Yeah, he doesn't have the tools. Well, it's also just not fun, you know. And the other side of it is, like, you know, there's the villains that you love to hate. Like, there's, like, a you know, the Cruella de Vils or the Ursulas. Like, you, you're excited about seeing them because they bring this element of fun versus, like, Ike Turner, people are showing up arms folded, you're upset, and rightly so. Like, he's he is an actual person who has actually done physical harm to someone you actually probably care about. So I get it. You know, it's kind of trying to unfold the humanity in that person so that, for me, it's more about the Ike Turners in the audience can actually see themselves and then possibly make a change. Because if you just display a monster, then a monster is going to have a harder time seeing himself and identifying with that versus, like, oh, I do that thing too, I should probably do better. You know what I mean? That's so deep. if you humanize, you know what I mean? Like, Because yeah. people go to theater to see themselves, really. And if you can't see yourself, then you can't really empathize with the people that are around that character that you're trying to, to, trying to connect to. Let's talk about Adrian Warner and the, the chemistry you guys have in working through that on stage because you yeah. have some difficult scenes, right? Sure. And there has to be a lot of trust, I think, in, in doing those scenes. And so what has it been like working with her through those kind of tense moments oh, on stage? Oh, man, that's my homie. You know, yeah. I've known I've literally known Adrian for 10 years. Like, And we, we met during The Wiz together. Also, Dawn, who plays Zelma, plays her mother. We all work together in The Wiz. That's where we all met um, at City Center. So, you know, we... We're coming into this with a level of like, I know you. I don't have any questions about you. You've seen me at my worst. I've seen you at your worst. So it's, now it's just like, how do we create a? It wasn't about how do we create a safe environment. The environment was already safe, and that was like, I was like, I don't really want to hit you. <laughs> like I don't want to hurt you. Like I don't want to. You know, how do I make sure that we make this look as real as possible without actually doing any physical harm to each other? So it was more so. The diving in of it was was kind of the harder part. Like I, I knew it was the safest space in the world. It's just like I don't want to do this to my friend, yeah. and you know. But um, yeah, she's she's one of the hardest working people that I know. She's such an athlete. Um, when you guys see this show, uh, she yeah. really embodies Tina physically. The energy. The end of the show is essentially a concert where she just gives you. Every, she just leaves it. I think on the stage. Yeah, it's a mic drop moment. You're just like, Boy. everybody's standing up. You're like, I'm, I am at a concert. It's crazy. I'm, and I'm backstage like this. <laughs> like, like, I haven't seen it every day. You know, it's, it's incredible. Yeah. So what has been the, your journey with this through previews? Like, take me through the changes you made and just that whole experience to bring to the show that we see now. Yeah, so the show's a little different from London. You know, so it's more so London audiences and American audiences are just different. We have different cultural references, we just understand things different. So the show is actually a little bit deeper here because we actually carry the trauma of, you know, a woman raised in the South and raised in America in the 60s, well, raised in the 30s, 40s, and 50s, but like coming of age in the 50s and the 60s into the 70s. So every, different jokes land differently. Um, uh, uh, cultural references hit home in a different way. So it was more so figuring that out those moments, like what worked in London might not work here, what worked in London actually might work here, and just figuring out what those balances were. Um, the hard part for me was like, I'm used to being a part of a process, like on Broadway. Like I've been either in a workshop or a reading or something, you know, out of town run. I had nothing with this, and Adrian is coming with, you know, her years and like all of it. So like, my insecurities were coming up. My insecurities were like, am I enough? Am I doing? Have I done enough research? Have I had enough time with this? You know, because you're figuring it out in front of 1,500 people every night. It's like, here's a new way to sing this song. Here's a new script. Here's new lines. Figure it out. And you're like, okay, great. Do I get to practice? No, nah, we'll just do it tonight. We'll just do it tonight. You know, so those things are, those are the harder parts. You know, just kind of like being okay with 
knowing that this might not be perfect tonight and I probably won't figure this out for another two weeks. And that's okay, you know, because I learned a new step. There's a new dance step today. Here's a new guitar riff. Learn that guitar riff for tonight. And, well, learn this guitar riff, but we're not going to put it in until next week, but start working on it now. But do the old one that you do regularly at night. It's just that brain yeah. teaser game that you play with yourself. And then what do you do to overcome that? You just do it? Suck it up. Yeah, I was <laughs> like, do you meditate? Yeah. Is there, are there other things that you, uh, other tools you use as an actor to sort of like, Calm yourself and just yeah. Well, what's it. great is that again, I have Adrian and Nkeki. Like, both there's two Tinas, yeah. you know, there's the evening Tina and the matinee Tina, you know. And but like, and Keki is from North Carolina, we're from the exact same area. So, like, there's there's a trust that I have, like, oh, you got me, I got you, you got me, cool, just breathe, but also, you know, just warming up before the show. Like, I have like a little little ritual that I have a salt rock, um, one of those salt lamps, mm -hmm. and it's it's kind of a it's, it's a double riff. It's like uh, Lawrence Fishburne, who played Ike Turner in the film. He has a play called Riff Raff. And at the beginning of the play, he says, let's light a candle for the ancestors and for the spirits to come into the room and play and then leave the candle on until the show's over and then we blow it out. So I turned the salt rock on to like bring in the spirits and channel like, you know, like Ike, come in, don't act up. Just <laughs> so don't stay. Don't stay. You know, come this you, this is your space, you know, but like chill out, you know, come look around. Um, and then, but it's also like a a, a nod to Lawrence Fishburne. Yeah. And then I turn the rock off when it's over. That's really cool. Um, yeah, and I say, what do I say? Acknowledge, recognize, accept, respect, appreciate, celebrate. Mm. Those are my like my words. Your affirmations. My affirmations. Like it, acknowledge what's going on, respect it, appreciate it, celebrate it, and then when it's over, like release it, let it go. Uh, speaking of celebrations, you mentioned Tina came opening yeah. night. We have a photo from that <laughs> night. Um, yeah. When you look back at this experience, ah, ah, can you just tell me what was going on, how you felt sweat holding her hand? Sweat trickling, you know, all of this is hot. There's <laughs> a lot of heat in this area. Um, I, I can't believe it. We're like, we're like laughing at each other because um, she's done this already. She's a pro. Um, <laughs> she was like, what does it feel like playing a villain? And I was like, ah. I don't know. You know, I'm happy if you're happy, you know, because it's, it's her story. You know, you want to take care of of someone's story. And the room was very different that night. You know, it's kind of like not the energy was sucked out, but it was a very reverent thing. You know, it's the woman who went through this is here and we're going to watch this with her. You know, so it felt very much like both church and theater. In a way, but you know, I'm, that grin is is 100. Like I was. Did you get to chat with her about being Ike at all, or what she thought, really. or was it just celebration? It was like such a whirlwind. Like bring, you know, come in, get out. Oprah was there. Gail was, like, it was like it was nuts. It was it was it was crazy. Like that I was, I was just happy to be in the room at that moment. You know. Um, we we have to talk about the music too. Sure. Um, obviously, the catalog for this is insane. Um, uh, do you have a song, whether you're in it or not, that you just always look forward to watching or seeing performed? Watching River Deep Mountain High from off stage is, you know, you know, it because it's that it's where the show shifts really. You know, it's that moment where uh, the uh, the character who plays um, Phil Spector says, "I want you to sing it like you're singing to the God in yourself." Do you know what that? Do you know what that's like? And she says, "Of course I do," and she does, but she just never done it before, and it's the first time that she does it. So, and I'm I get to just, you know, <laughs> at a concert and, and enjoy it. Um, but doing uh. Proud Mary um, is just is just fun. It's just the whole band and just iconic. Yeah. What was your journey like to theater? Was Broadway always the goal? Because I know this is what like your eighth Broadway show ninth. or something? ninth ninth Broadway show. Was this always the goal? What was your journey through acting? When did it start? Like yes and no. Like I had I was still non equity the year before I moved to New York. I was still non equity. I moved to New York um, and I met an actor who I was how was I twenty. Two twenty three, and I met an actor who was forty five who had just made his Broadway debut. So I just wrapped my head around that. Oh, okay, I'll just work a little bit, you know. And if twenty in, years, in twenty years, if I'm so lucky, I'll, you know, I might make it to Broadway. You know, the next year I was on Broadway in The Color Purple, and you know, I I started I started doing theater, and then I started dance like I like left theater, started tap dancing, like went more into a dance realm, and then it brought me back to musical theater. And I was just kind of like, I didn't know anything. Like, I knew movie musicals, but, like, I didn't really know. Like, I remember Rent had come out, like, two years before I started. And everyone was like, Rent! And I was like, what's that? You don't know what Rent is? Nah, I never heard of it. You know, I did. I knew Mary Poppins. Right. <laughs> I That's knew classic. Chitty Chitty Bang Bang, I got you. Um, 
So it was it was more of a it was just an idea. I didn't really know what the profession of it was. I didn't I didn't really get it. I just knew it was fun to do. And then over time, like college, and I started to learn more and realize, like, oh, I could maybe do this for a living. Maybe I mean you you have I mean Color Purple in the Heights Motown at Hamilton. Is there a role on Broadway that for you really kind of like clicked? clicked you into high gear when you were like, okay, this is, I am a stage performer. This is my calling. This is what I'm doing. Oh, man. Uh, maybe in college. College? Maybe. Because this is my first lead. You know, this yeah. is my first role yeah. um, on Broadway. Um, but, like, because even, like, with Broadway, it's like, it feels like a fluke. You do your first shows, like, they're not going to let me stay here. Mm. You know, then you do, an, if you get another one, it's like, okay, this might be. Yeah. A thing, and then you do the third, and it's like, okay, this is what I do. So yeah, around Memphis was when I was like, okay, I'm a Broadway performer. I get to, I did this for a living. And then it was about trying to cross over into TV and film, if that was possible, um, which apparently is. Um, it is. Um, so yeah, it's now it's just kind of like, all right, now that I do this, what else can I do? That was really what it came down to. Like, what else can I do to like feed the fire and keep me interesting and interested in performing? And you have a lot of other stuff going on. I know you have The Jam, which is your one-man show. I like you for that. Uh, you know what? That See, was a clean transition, right? You're really right? good. You're really good. <laughs> so tell us about that one-man show. And you will you have some shows coming up in January at Joe's Pub? Yes. Yeah. Um, the Jam is um, an homage to my great-grandmother, who used to make jam. You can't make it a jar at a time. You have to make it in bulk. So she would make herself a jar and give the rest away. So I've been writing stuff since I was like 12, 13, it's more so like I feel some kind of way, I'm gonna write it down. And then it started to evolve into like poetry, spoken word, hip hop, bad raps. Um, <laughs> and over time I like accumulated all this stuff and it felt like I was hoarding it. Like I had all this like stuff that I should share with other people. So I got a, some friends together, got a little band together and it was a jam session. This is my jam, I'm sharing it. And it was a play on words and then I realized that jam versus jelly is that jam has like the seeds and the flesh and the pulp still in it. Jelly's like that runoff. Like <laughs> I don't want that. I want I want stuff. I want the you know authentic. Authentic can get a little sticky. Yeah. You know. Um, so it's worked its way to a one man show. Like after like six piece band and special guests and backup singers and stuff, it's like whittled itself back down to just oh. me. Um, I went to therapy, mm -hmm. and I realized in the therapy that um, being an only child in a single parent home. Um, and a latchkey kid kind of created an individual. Mm -hmm. And then going to therapy, it was like, I equated it to inviting a stranger to the attic of your mind, mm -hmm. and you haven't been there in a while, and you got all this stuff up there, and you don't want anybody to see it, so you kind of like bit by bit, like open a little box, and then you realize like, you have to like turn the lights on and like expose the whole attic and to really get into it, get into the weeds of it. And that's why people don't go back because it's like, oh, I gotta, I gotta, it's I gotta hard. clean up this whole attic. Yeah. I'm good. I don't wanna do that. So, so that's what it is. It's a journey through the attic of my mind. It's called the Jam Only Child, um, and it's at Joe's Pub. So it's deeply personal. Yeah. Yeah, we're gonna learn a lot about you yeah. from the words. Yeah. And I would like you to share some of those words with us, if I you can will. Do that. I actually, can do you that. Take, you take the stage. I'll do that. I'll take the stage. Right. Hey, everybody. Um, this is. I'm gonna do the final piece. So if you come to the Jam. January 6th, 10th, 12th, and 20th at Joe's Pub. Uh, this is where we get to. Um, and it's it's kind of like after I've looked back, looking in the rearview mirror to see like where I've come through. And it's I sat down with the universe. It said, you first, Daniel, what have you learned? I said, truth can set you free, but truth hurts when you shirk your destiny. And then the universe gave a wink and said, don't just make them laugh, Daniel, make them think. They may want to hide, but you can help them look inside. You took a dive off a cliff, but notice this, you survived. And then the universe stood me up and said, God is always inside you. Stop looking up. Focus only on the things you've got cooking up. No second guessing, no questions. Know that you are good enough. And that shook me up because I didn't know I needed it. Thought I had been defeating my demon, but I was feeding it. Thought I had been doing the work, but when I looked in my earth, I had no seed in it. My treason was that I didn't have my trees in. Focused on the lifetime when I had missed the season. Focused on the summertime when I had missed the reason. Focused on the shoes to fill instead of the ones my feet were in. All my fear was in keeping up appearances. Apparently I needed to be keeping up my pyramids. I'm peering into tomorrow, living in the moment. Letting go of the sorrow cause I got no need to hold it. You know what? 
The universe said to me to leave the pain behind, focus on what's ahead of me. That word was bread to me. I'm spreading all my legacy. Every word I said this eve is thoroughbred and pedigree. This star and train is part constellation, less celebrity. But I'm going to celebrate when times are tough. I'm going to meditate. I'm heavy handed for a featherweight. Bye to that other guy. I opted out of feathers. I'm rocking wings of a butterfly. Never wore a metaphor better before I metamorphosed. My name is Daniel J. Watts. This message, I support this. Make sure you go vote. I went from attaboy to an adult. No longer a caterpillar, a pillar of a man. Now watch me catapult. I'm focused on what matters more. Dog, I'm in the pool like a Labrador. Dodging all the bull, I'm a matador. Master of my fate, I'm the captain of my soul. I sparked this flame when darkness came. I'm about to glow, getting mine. Hitting till quitting time. And this marathon that I'm on will not enter the finish line. I'm setting my pace, gritting my teeth, grit on my face, leaning into the wind, giving praise. I was gifted with grace. I have everything I need. I let the rest weed out. No weapon can harm me. God won't let me bleed out. I'm working this reroute, working my dreams out, bursting at the seams. It seems I'm working my wings out, and I'm going to go forward. I'm going to take steps. Life is improvisation. Just say yes. Stay faithful. Be encouraged for the faithless. Be grateful. That's how you stay blessed. Thank you. Hey, that's like a woo. Thank you. Uh, can I get your therapist number or? I got you. I mean. I got you. That was beautiful. Thank you. Yeah. That's, I'm going to come to that show. Please. Yes, I will. Please. That's fantastic. I got something for you. All right. See, I got pins. Oh, here. I got, we, I got got little, we got, got merch. I got, a little, I got a little swag. Where is it? Where pal, is it? Pal. I got you. Here are the other pins. Oh, my God. Only child pin. Only child. I got like eight siblings, but, you know, I'll wear the other one. You need some more? I need to get you. <laughs> but, you know, you, you wear that. No, I got you. Thank I'll you so it. much. Nah, That's very it. sweet. Uh, before we go, we do have a couple of questions. Do it. Uh, we're right there. Hi. Hi. I've seen you perform on Broadway, and you're what? so lovely to watch. Uh, and you spoke earlier to being part of a process, and I was wondering if there was a particular process or show or creative team that you've worked with or worked on that um, particularly touched you or that you enjoyed. Oh, um, man, probably the answer is all of them. But uh, uh, Lights Out, Nat King Cole is a show that uh, I worked with. Uh, Patricia McGregor is the co-writer and director. Coleman Domingo, who's... I love Coleman Domingo. Everything. That's like, that's my man. Um, he enlisted me and Dulé Hill to play Nat King Cole, and I play Sammy Davis Jr. And it's, uh, it's, a, it's a journey into Nat King Cole and what might have been going on in his mind as his show was about to be canceled on NBC. And Sammy kind of shows up as a kind of an antagonist to be like, you know, go out with a bang, you know, because they were kind of two sides of the same coin. But we we did a we did table reads, you know, like we started with the bare, the like bare, bare bones of it, two uh two or three table reads. Then we did uh a process uh at New York Station Film. We had another reading and we did another reading in, in San Diego. And then we did it in Malvern, Pennsylvania, like in the middle of nowhere. So it was just the time just to cultivate it and get it, you know. And then like a year later, we did it again in L.A. this last year. You know, so it's like just the, to be able to, like, sit with a piece has been amazing. You know, it's amazing. It's what I didn't get with, <laughs> with Tina, you know. Um, but, yeah, that's probably one of the most special moments just because it um, – Sammy is a huge idol of mine, and it made me look at him deeper, you know. Um, and Nat King Cole just to – the doors that he was knocking down. And Nat King Cole's, he's one of those people whose voices we don't really know. We know his voice, but he didn't really get to speak for himself because he died at 45. So there's no autobiography. There's no, like, documentary. It's just kind of like you take other people's accounts of him that we have to go off of. But that process was, like, one of my favorites. Thanks for asking. And next question. Hi. I was wondering if you could play anyone living or dead, anyone else that you haven't already played, who would it be? That's funny to say. Ooh! Living or dead. I think Basquiat. Jean-Michel Basquiat would be an interesting thing to dig into. Also dangerous. But <laughs> um, I feel like that might send you down some road. Ew, he's yeah, he just fascinates me, just his, you know, they call him the radiant child, you know, and he, I'm a, I have literally have a tattoo, a Basquiat crown right here. Huge fan. Um, but I think he was onto something that I don't know if he accomplished or he fully accomplished it. You know what I mean? It's one, I don't know which is which. Like, did he 
burn out too soon or did he do everything he was here to do and then, you know, left us with riddles and puzzles? So I think that would be a fun thing to kind of investigate. Yeah, he's fascinating. I mean, yeah. his demons were so strong and the art he created so rapidly. I mean, that would be so such rapidly. a, like yeah. you said, probably a dangerous road to go down, but entertaining. Yeah, I think I'm going to go, though. I'm going to go down there. I'm going to take that challenge. That's amazing. Can't wait to see that on top of all the amazing other things you're doing. Like I said, Daniel will be performing those four shows of The Jam at the Under the Radar Festival at Joe's Pub in January. So make sure you check that out. And check him out in Tina, the Tina Turner musical playing at the Lou Fontaine Theater. Put your hands together for Daniel J. Watts. Thank you very much. You're awesome.